So the title of the talk is um, Wallace, a flexible platform for reproducible modeling of species, niches, and distributions built for community expansion. Um, this is our current uh, development team. And uh, these are all of our numerous affiliations. So a bit about uh, me, uh, very briefly. So I am a PhD candidate in Rob Anderson's lab at CCNY. Uh, we do uh, biogeography, a lot of spatial modeling. My dissertation is on integrating biotic interactions into uh, distribution slash niche models. And I'll be beginning a postdoc next year at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Okinawa, Japan, in the lab of Evan Economo, who's also a biogeographer and who works with ants. So, um, the um, ubiquitous slide about um, species uh, distribution slash niche models. I'll go over this quickly because this might be a review for a lot of you, but might not for some others. So um, a, what we'll call distribution models are um, models that use occurrence records uh, of species and environmental data. We take the values of the environmental data uh, at the coordinates of the occurrence records we use an algorithm to build a relationship between those two things. And we have a uh, model of a, what we're gonna call a niche, which is uh, more or less usually an, an abiotic uh, representation of the niche because we're mostly using climatic uh, variables. This is not the case at in all times. Um, and then we use that model to uh, project suitability onto a map because uh, if we have environmental gridded data, um, uh, for uh, an area of interest, we can use that mathematical model to uh, predict what the suitability will be. Um, and so you'll see that uh, in the map over there, um, it's gonna be some kind of continuous gradient from non-suitable to suitable. Um, and the interpretation of suitable can get a little bit hairy, but we're just gonna call them suitable areas for now. Um, so traditionally, uh, these kinds of models have been built using uh, some kind of GUI. Um, a lot of researchers were using code to build models, but um, because a lot of easy to use GUIs came out, um, uh, most researchers ended up sh shifting to GUIs. Um, the example here is a very poor resolution image of the Maxent GUI. Um, it's just one example of, of, of uh, a number of GUIs used to make these models. Uh, these GUIs often um, have default settings, which are supposed to be uh, generally useful in a general case, uh, but might not be appropriate for, for your particular case. Um, they're relatively inflexible. They usually have settings, some of which are a bit hidden. Um, and if you're not uh, good at exploring the GUI, you might not find a lot of the settings or know that they exist. Um, they're also infrequently updated. So these GUIs are the product of in a single individual or a research team. Uh, if that individual or team does not have the time to update frequently, it doesn't get updated. Um, and then it also, they usually require uh, uh, numerous other applications uh, in order to complete a full modeling analysis because you need to format your occurrence data using some kind of uh, spreadsheet software like Microsoft Excel. You're going to need a, uh, some kind of mapping software like a GIS um, in order to view the maps and, and make maps after you build the model. And so um, uh, a lot of different uh, software packages are needed in order to complete this. On the other hand, we have code. Um, code is written by an individual, so it is um, inherently error prone. Uh, if you make a mistake in your code and it doesn't make an error, uh, that little mistake can get perpetuated through the entire analysis and, and you wouldn't even really know unless you viewed it more carefully the next time. Uh, this is more hard to do with the GUI because it, of its inflexibility. It's, it's, it's kind of built so that you won't make so many huge mistakes. Um, and the code also is not usually easily generalizable. So um, uh, usually you're writing it for yourself or for your particular project and uh, you don't usually comment as well as you should. And if you were to hand that code off to somebody else, uh, they might not know how to use it or how to um, 
commandeer it for their particular purposes. So each of these things has uh, positives and negatives. Um, so there is a, a need in biodiversity informatics for software that achieves this balance between uh, automation and supervision, um, particularly for um, some kind of software that would automate the repetitive aspects of coding. So um, unless you're a whiz at for loops, a lot of coding is pretty repetitive. And even if you are a whiz at for loops and you know what for loops are, uh, there's a lot of repetitive aspects to this too. Um, so GUIs can, can take care of that for you. Um, it also, um, we're interested in developing software that forces users to make decisions. So if you're an ecologist, we, uh, you'd it would be best if you wear your ecologist hat while you're doing your analysis instead of just pushing buttons. And uh, also, it would be good to have some kind of software that is general with respect to all the different algorithms that are used to make these models. There's a wide diversity of algorithms available. Um, some GUIs exist that offer all the algorithms you could ever imagine uh, in, in the software. Uh, but again, all of them usually have some kind of default settings and are, and are hard to, um, to, uh, to change. So uh, our team had an idea to combine um, code-based methods with a GUI. So a lot of, or most of, the new methods in ecology these days are released as code in some form, uh, usually as R packages in ecology. Um, if you pick up any issue of methods in ecology and evolution, you'll see every month there are three or four new packages that come out that are very useful for a particular kind of analysis. Um, however, if you don't really know how to use code or are not comfortable using code for your analysis, they're not really accessible to you. So our idea was to have a GUI um, where the foreground is this um, uh, interface, kind of like what I just showed you. Um, but that the interface, our idea was that the interface should be flexible. Um, it should be extensible. So that when you want to build new parts of it, it should be easy to, to, to uh, insert those new parts in for when new methods come out. And it should also be informative. It should um, uh, 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 have information uh, about um, the methodology inside the GUI to, to teach you about the methods as you're using the GUI. Um, in the background would be R code. Uh, why R? Because R is the lingua franca of ecology right now. Um, it is not necessarily better than any other language. It just happens to be what everyone uses. And I find it quite useful. Um, so R would be running because there are so many uh, existing and, and new packages in R that allow people to do great analysis in ecology. Uh, our team came out with some recent-ish uh, R packages, namely um, spfin, which does spatial thinning of occurrence points to uh, reduce uh, spatial uh, bias and uh, spatial autocorrelation, and also ENM eval, which um, iterates uh, model building in Maxent and allows you to do um, model selection. And so we, we wanted to um, disseminate the, the methods in these packages to a broader audience than just the, um, the ecologists who, who code all the time. So we submitted our idea, we called it Wallace, um, to the Ebe Nielsen Challenge, uh, which was uh, put on by GBIF. And uh, the call was to, to develop a project that makes innovative use of GBIF data. And we were lucky enough to get to the finalist round. Um, what we did was we combined these methods that I just discussed um, with uh, an R package called Shiny, which allows uh, you to make a, uh, kind of like a web app style GUI that has R running in the background, which is exactly what we wanted to do. So we're thankful that uh, GUI ex uh, Shiny existed when we, were, when we were thinking about this. And what we came up with was uh, this, Wallace. It's, a, it's the software that I'm talking about today. Um, I should mention that it is named after Alfred Russell Wallace, the uh, founder of biogeography and co-discoverer of evolution, who is um, often overlooked but not anymore. So uh, I'll talk a bit about what is Wallace and, and, and why do we think Wallace is important. There are some qualities of the software Wallace that um, we think exemplify what um, modern scientific software uh, uh, should represent. 
So in a sentence, it's a point and click application, which, which is a GUI, a graphic user interface that features a niche slash distribution modeling workflow. But we envision that in the future, uh, it will include many more ecological modeling techniques. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Wallace has certain qualities um, that make it great. Um, they are listed below. I'll be going over each of them uh, briefly. Uh, I just wanted to mention there's a, a link underneath there uh, for the Wallace uh, webpage, which will be at the end of the demonstration uh, uh, as well. And uh, this is the uh, original development team that came up with the software. Uh, and we published a software note recently in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. Um, so please give it a look if you're interested. So first of all, Wallace is, uh, Wallace's code is open and it is free. Um, so that means that the code is up on GitHub, which is kind of like a Facebook for nerdy coders. Um, and you can go there and view, download uh, the code, edit it, do whatever you want with it anytime you want. Um, and uh, kind of th we, we think that this is very important going forward because um, this epitomizes flexibility. And it also um, allows people to to um, to play around with what exists and alter things for their own uses. Uh, I should also mention that um, Wallace makes use of um, open databases like GBIF and VertNet um, for bioinformatics, and so we we allow access to these open databases as well. Wallace also provides guidance, so it's instructive. Um, there, is, uh, there are two levels of guidance, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, and this guidance addresses conceptual and methodological issues um, and also includes um, links to the literature, which we thought was important. Uh, Wallace is flexible. So uh, it provides the user with multiple options uh, and also allows um, uh, different kinds of interactions with, with the data that you're analyzing. So you can input data to Wallace and you can export data from Wallace in multiple forms. <coughs> and uh, Wallace is interactive. <coughs> so the, the focus uh, is a, a huge interactive map that kind of uh, feels like Google Maps uh, that you can use to explore uh, uh, your points and, and take a look at um, uh, the, the area of interest uh, on, a, on a dynamic map. But it also has dynamic tables that you can sort. And it also has um, dynamic graphs that update uh, when the user changes uh, various controls. And Wallace is reproducible. So uh, this was especially exciting. So we were able to um, program Wallace so that at any point during the analysis, you can download a script that is annotated that you can run in R to reproduce all of the results in, uh, uh, in your session. And I'll talk more about that soon. And finally, Wallace is built to be expandable. So um, we know that for each of these um, steps, which I'll outline uh, in, in a bit of the analysis, there are many different options that you know, different people have advocated and different labs talk about and want people to use. And we want to make sure that these people can um, add their, their methods into Wallace. Uh, we're interested in plurality of science and, and not advocating for a particular way of doing things. And so uh, we made Wallace modular, which means that uh, the analysis steps uh, consist of different modules that the user can choose from. And I'll go over those too. So um, I'm going to begin a walkthrough of Wallace. And let me know, um, but before I do that, I have a few things I want to say. So first of all, how do you install Wallace? For those of you who are not our users, it might be a little mysterious, so I'll, I'll go over this very briefly. Um, first, we need to install R. Um, which is free, so don't worry about that. And optionally, our studio, which is a big um, wrapper for R that I find very, very useful for programming and has a lot of neat features that make uh, R a bit easier to use, but it's not, um, it's not necessary. Um, 
you would, if you want to use Maxent in Wallace, you would need to download it. Um, I have a link right there to the American Museum of Natural History, which is currently housing Maxent. Maxent is now open if you did not know. And so uh, uh, it's, it's also easier to get. Um, you also need to make sure you have the appropriate uh, version of Java for your system. Um, Maxent runs on Java. Um, there are sometimes problems with installing Java, and I have um, troubleshooting on the GitHub page at the, on the link below. So if you're having any problems with that, I've encountered almost all of them and written uh, how to fix them down on the GitHub page. So uh, please uh, see that. And then um, you'd also need to place the maxent.jar, which is the um, software that runs Maxent, into the uh, folder for the Dismo package. If this all sounds like um, uh, mumbo jumbo to you, then as you're using Wallace, it will inform you exactly where to put it. And uh, it's really not a big deal. You just kind of move a file from one place to another. Unfortunately, uh, Dismo works this way. I'm not very happy about it, but um, there's not much we can do. And we're thinking about ways to make it a bit easier in the future. However, if you don't want to use Maxent, you don't have to bother with this at all. Um, you install the Wallace package from CRAN, which is a R package repository um, with these three lines of code. Um, literally, these three lines of code, uh, once you run them, Wallace will be running um, unless you encounter enormous problems. And then you should contact me. Uh, so before I jump to the live demonstration, um, Wallace is composed of components which are analysis steps. We've broken down uh, the analysis into eight steps. Uh, there, there are certainly, people could argue that there are more than these. We tried to simplify. Um, we might include others in the future, uh, but for now there are these um, simple eight. Um, within each of these components, there are choices, and those choices are called modules. So um, in the A row in the diagram, you'll see the components. It starts with obtaining occurrence data, obtaining environmental data, processing these, and it ends with modeling and then visualizing the results of the model, and then also projecting it uh, to other areas and times. The last um, column is the session code column. So this is where you can download your code. And you can see there are a couple of options for uh, file formats for downloading the code. The B row uh, are the upload and download options that currently exist for each uh, component. The C row are the major R packages that are used. So we made this big effort to try to highlight the R packages that are used in each of the components. Uh, Wallace is kind of this um, big application that uses a lot of packages. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we acknowledge all the working parts. Um, and then D is the uh, modules. And I'll go over a lot of them during the live demonstration. And now we begin the live demonstration. So I'm going to open up our studio, and I will type. Uh, it's probably hard to see this. Better. I will type um, library wallets, which loads the wallets package. I've already installed it. Um, R will load up these essential packages, Shiny, which is what I just discussed for the web app interface, and Leaflet, which is the map uh, the map uh, so uh, software that Wallace uses to make the map. And then I will use the only function in Wallace that is accessible to you, and that is run Wallace. And there are no parameters, and I press Enter, and then I get Wallace. It's literally that easy. Um, so even if you're not an R user, um, it's quite easy to do this if you have R. So this is the landing page. It explains what Wallace is, uh, who we think it's for, attributes, which is just discussed, um, uh, a link to the email, some references. Uh, this is just the, uh, the workflow. So we start with occurrence data. Um, and you'll notice that there are two main parts to the screen. There's this left side, and there's this right side. So the left side are the controls. And it's also where you choose uh, which module you're on. Um, up here are all the components. So we're on the first component, which is obtain occurrence data. And uh, we're currently on the module called query database, which, which allows you to download occurrence records from different databases. 
Um, you'll see the map is over here. We can zoom around on it uh, like a Google map. Um, you have little zoom controls. And then these other tabs are not relevant now because nothing's going on but, um, oh, besides components guidance and module guidance. But the table and results are just not there yet. Um, before we use any of these controls, it's a good idea to kind of read the guidance. We tried to keep it as brief as possible uh, while also being informative as possible. And uh, again, we included references in case you wanted to know more details. So the component level guidance is about obtaining the, the occurrence records themselves. And the module guidance is specific to each module. So when we are on the query database uh, module, we see information about these databases. But we're, when we're on um, user specified, we would see um, a different uh, guidance for, for this module. So you can enter your own data as a CSV in addition to getting data from the databases. <clears throat> so what we'll do, we'll do is download some data from GBIF. I will download data for uh, Tremarctos or Natus, which is the spectacle there. And I will leave it at the default of 100 occurrences. So I'll press query database. You'll notice that in the corner it has a little progress bar. And we get our data. Um, you'll notice that some of these points might be a bit dubious, um, but we'll address that soon. And we can zoom in and you know take a look at where the a bulk of these points are. They're in and around the Andes Mountains, which is a good sign. Thank you, GBIF. Um, and you can also download these data um, using this button. So we can press this. We can open that in Excel. And we can see that we have the entire GBIF table uh, for these uh, 100 records. Uh, it's quite long. Uh, because it's so long, we decided to condense it a bit and show you this, um, this condensed version of the table, which includes um, the columns we thought are most useful to biogeographers. Um, we might add some columns in the future, but these are, are, are the ones we thought were most important right now. Uh, we also added a, a unique occurrence ID because as we will be modifying this data set, you might want to know which points were removed uh, during the cleaning. Um, you'll notice that up here, there's a log box. Um, so this tells you um, uh, after you complete any kind of um, uh, operation, it re will report the results to you. So it tells us that we got um, 100 records out of GBIF, but there is a total of 237 in the database. If we want to get all the data possible, we might want to increase uh, this range a bit. Um, some records were removed, so 51 records had no coordinates. Those were taken out. And there were three duplicate records, which means the uh, lat longs were exactly the same. So the remaining records are 46. We have 46 data points right now. Um, this is a uh, very basic cleaning step, but, but it is very important because uh, you don't want to include duplicate data. So um, we will now move on to the next step. I also want to highlight that you could change the base map up here. So if you don't like the Esri topo, you can look at the Nat Geo base map or um, this, this one. There's a lot of choices. Um, we're going to stick with this because it's the easiest to see. So we'll move on to the next component, which is processing your occurrence data. So as we, as we saw, there are some points that are in areas that uh, I didn't know spectacle bears live in, like southern Japan and, uh, and LA. So those are pretty dubious. And I'm not a bear biologist, but um, still, I'm, I'm skeptical. So because I'm so skeptical, I might want to reduce my data set spatially to just the area that I'm sure that the bear lives in. Uh, these are probably museum uh, records. So what I can do is draw on the map to indicate the uh, points that I want to keep. So I click on this draw polygon button, and I can just draw a polygon around my points. I will finish my shape, and I will select these occurrences. And it zooms into them. And you notice that the other ones are now gone. So those are now out of my analysis, and I'm just concentrating on these points. I can always uh, reset this and kind of go back to where I was if I made a mistake, um, but I'll keep these points for now. Okay. Um, I might also want to remove individual points without having to draw anything. So I might zoom in and say, um, you know, I don't, I don't know about this point in Panama. Uh, I'm very skeptical about this. I'd click on it. It has the ID of 87. 
as an expert bear biologist, I could say, oh, I know that, you know, plentiful bear does not live on the Caribbean coast. I'm going to take this out. Um, it has number 87. I enter it here, 87. I remove it, and now it's gone. And you can even see this in the occurrence uh, table. If you were to look all the way down at 87, it's no longer there. I might also want to spatially thin. So you might have noticed that some of the, the points are pretty clustered in some areas. That's a problem for modeling because it induces uh, spatial autocorrelation in the model response. And it also might be a signal of, uh, of a sampling bias. You might want to reduce that by thinning spatially. So we're going to use 10 kilometers as our uh, thinning distance. So when we run this algorithm, which is spthin, the one, uh, our package I talked about that our lab helped develop, it ensures that no points are um, 10 kilometers, uh, 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 are a distance of 10 kilometers or closer to each other. So it reduces this clustering. So I'm gonna run this algorithm, you'll see the progress bar. Because I'm on a fast computer, it was so quick. It's hard to see which ones were removed, so we can zoom in here um, and you'll notice that the blue points were removed, the red were retained, so we can see that some of this clustering is now gone, which is a good thing for us. So now we can move on. We can also download this process data set here. Um, it's not the same table as before, uh, but it includes the essential information for us, which is the ID, which links us back to this table. And we notice that now we have 35 points instead of the original, uh, I think it was 46, yes. So now we're down to 35, but we have a much cleaner occurrence data set. So we're happy. We're gonna move on now to the environmental data uh, component. Uh, we have two options. We have um, getting the world clim, bio clim variables, which are very popular. We also have user specified, so you can enter your own rasters in actually. What we'll do today is work with the 10 arc minute um, bio clim data, which is the coarsest data but runs the fastest. And you'll see this is just direct output from R, which is um, our stats on the uh, all the rasters we just downloaded um, and uh, indicates that we now have them available for the analysis. If you were interested in selecting variables for your analysis, you could specify exactly which ones to download and use. For now, we'll just use these 19. So moving on, uh, we are now going to process these rasters uh, so this is important because we need to specify the um, area uh, for uh, background sampling. So it, with uh, presence background models, we're um, comparing uh, uh, the uh, species occurrences, which are the presences, to a sample of the available uh, area, which is known as background. And uh, it's important to specify this correctly. You don't want to make a background that's too big or that includes areas that the species um, is not able to get to. Um, this is kind of a complicated um, topic, and so we have some information in the uh, guidance text, which is which is pretty important, and you should read up on. Um, but we have three options for defining this background, uh, this available area for the species that we're going to compare to the presence points. We have a bounding box, which is exactly how it sounds. It's just a big box. We have a minimum convex polygon, which fits the points a bit more tightly, and we have these point buffers. Um, which uh, are the most conservative uh, for, for the, the background extent. Uh, for today, we'll do a minimum convex polygon. Let's make a, a buffer around it of one degree. And we're going to sample our background points. Uh, let's go with the default 10,000. You can increase this to however many you would like. So we're sampling right now. It's picking random cells and, and giving them background values or extracting the environmental uh, variables, uh, values for those background points. So now that we have that done, we can see that that, that has been complete. We'll move on to the partitioning stage. So um, where we, in order to evaluate our models, we use something called cross-validation. Um, cross-validation uh, breaks the, uh, the occurrence data into groups. It builds a model on all the groups but one, and then tests the model uh, on that group that was left out. And it repeats that over and over until all the groups were done. Um, this is uh, 
uh, done by assigning partition values to each point, so putting them into groups. There are two different main different ways to, to do this. Uh, one is a, a spatial partition and one is a non-spatial. So an example of the non-spatial would just be, you know, random. Let's use two random groups and randomly assign one uh, a point to, to a group. Um, you can change the number of folds, which is the, the parlance for groups. So we can use four groups instead of uh, 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 two. We can, you know, use 10 if we wanted to and complicate our lives. Um, or we can do a, a jackknife, which assigns each uh, point to its own individual group. And this is, this is good for uh, small uh, data sets. Um, you can also alternatively do a spatial partition, uh, one of which is the block. So this um, divides things spatially. Uh, why might this be useful? Um, uh, we might be interested in, in building a model that can predict to areas it's unfamiliar with uh, well. And in order to do this, um, we, a spatial partition uh, figures this out very well because um, the model, for example, would be built on these three groups and predicting to this last one that's left out, which is probably some kind of new environmental space. And so you have a better understanding of how well the model transfers if you were to look at the evaluation results. All of that information and more is in this guidance, so um, please take a look at it. Uh, for, for today, we're going to go with this block partition, though. We'll move on to modeling. So here's, here's where the action happens. We can run uh, two different models in, in uh, Wallace currently, uh, Bioplum and Maxent. We're going to um, run Bioplum first, just so fast. And you get your results. So um, <clears throat> we have uh, different evaluation statistics, all of which are explained um, uh, exhaustively in this uh, quite long uh, guidance text. So please take a look at it. Um, uh, and I won't go over them now, but we have different variations of AUC and emission rates, which are useful in determining how well your model did. Um, we, these bins refer to um, the spatial partitions that we use. So we have four bins and you can see how well each bin did individually or just the average of all the bins, which are these stats. Um, we can also run a maxent model. Uh, so um, I won't go over uh, what this means in detail. Um, please check the guidance again. But um, we can select which feature classes to use for our maxent model. These um, uh, allow differing levels of model complexity. So we're going to just look at um, maybe two of them today. And we're going to look at, um, so linear are, produces very simple models. Hinge produces quite complex models. So we'll look at both the kinds. And uh, we're also going to look at a, a range of different regularization multipliers. These penalize complexity. So it's important to look at all the combinations possible of, of, of uh, the differing levels of, co of complexity we're interested in, build a whole bunch of models, and then look at how they all did and choose our optimal model. Um, and so we're going to run these models. You can see that um, it is currently running down here. Um, so in the background, ENM eval, that package I talked about before, is running, and it is iterating uh, and building many models um, and uh, uh, calculating all of their evaluation statistics. So when the Maxent models are done, we will see two tables, uh, which is different from how the BioClim looks. We'll see a table that has all the averages for the partitions, and we'll also see a table that shows, um, like this table does, the results for each of the bins. And it's almost done here. Here we go. So um, this is the table that you would get in R if you ran ENM eval. Um, you can download this table as a CSV. Um, there it is. And uh, you can also sort the table in Wallace. So say that we're interested in minimizing the <clears throat> emission rate. So we can minimize it this way. So um, on the top, we have the models with the lowest emission rates. You see that there are two of them. Uh, to break the tie, we might look at a different stat, like the um, average test AUC. We see that H2, so hinge, uh, with a regularization multiplier of two, um, and hinge three are, are pretty similar. 
I'd say probably this, almost the same. Um, so let's just select H2 as our optimal model for now. What I want to emphasize is that Wallace does not choose models for you. Uh, you have to be the ecologist, you have to be the statistician, and you have to make the decisions by yourself, uh, given uh, with the information that's available to you, which um, I, uh, I feel like I'm being repetitive, but it's all here. Here is the information. So we're going to go with H2 for now. So let's go to the visualized step. We can take a look at uh, how our model did visually. So we can look at evaluation plots. They're a little bit uh, not as interesting as they might be if you ran a million models. Uh, but we can see how they did on a graph. We can look at the different evaluation stats. And we see that they all did pretty similar. We have a pretty simple data set. We can take a look at the response curve. So on the x is the variable of interest. And on the y is suitability. We can see how suitability scales with uh, ranges of environmental variables. The, the variables that you're allowed to look at are the ones that have uh, non-zero coefficients in the model. So Maxent will do this thing where it tosses out variables that don't do a good job of predicting the data, and um, those do not enter the model. So we're only left with a subset of the original variables we, we chose. And so we can see um, how those responses were. We can also download them as PNGs. Here's a nice example. There it is. Um, perhaps most interestingly, most interestingly, we can take a look at the map prediction. Let's take a look at Ma uh, Maxent's logistic prediction for our area of interest. Our background extent, it's right here. Uh, I plotted the raster and you can see, there it is. Um, predicted suitability is over here on the right. And we can see that um, as we might expect, uh, the high elevation areas are highly suitable. So it looks like Maxent did an okay job this time. Uh, we can download the uh, raster as any one of these things. I'm going to demonstrate uh, GeoTIFF, which is a industry standard. Um, I have a software called QGIS, which is a free GIS software. And I'm going to open this raster with QGIS um, to demonstrate how easy it is to take these uh, predictions and move them to other software to make maps or do anything you need to do. Um, you can even just take screenshots of, of this, this um, uh, leaflet map if you want, but to make something more professional, you might want to put it in a GIS software and, and alter it a bit, give it a different symbology, what have you. Um, okay, I'm going to move on now to the project step. So we've seen how our model uh, looks in the background extent, which is the uh, area used for model training. We might want to project that model to other areas. So I might be interested uh, in a hypothetical situation where uh, spectacled bears um, invade southern South America. Um, so here we can draw a new polygon. And let's just see, let's say spectacled bears invaded Chile. So we can draw a new polygon and project to that new area. We can see what the suitability might look like. And look, it's actually quite suitable for spectacled bears. Uh, Chilean should uh, should watch out. Um, and we can also set thresholds. So what I didn't mention before is that we can uh, convert this continuous raster to a binary one. So to predicted presences and absences uh, to make some kind of uh, uh, predicted range map. And so here's just one of the options, but we can see uh, if we were to make this map binary, oh my goodness. Um, Chile will be full of uh, spectacled bears with this threshold. But if we use a different threshold, um, the scenario might be a bit different. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a little less hazardous in this scenario. Uh, again, we're, we're, the, we're interested in, in giving the user the flexibility to use lots of different thresholds. Uh, we have two right now. There are many more possible ones we could add. Uh, but this is mostly for uh, demonstrative purposes. Um, we have a, a very generous threshold, which I just showed you, and a more conservative one, which is right here. Uh, we could also go back to this map and, and uh, look at our thresholds here. Um, so this is what um, the more conservative threshold would look like uh, if uh, um, I made the map binary. You can see that blue are the predicted presences and the grays are the absences. Or we can just look at our, our continuous map like we did before. Uh, we could also project a new time. So for that extent, let's say I wanted to know um, in 2070 <clears throat> if uh, the bears invaded Chile, um, 
under a, a hellish uh, 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 global uh, climate scenario. Um, let's just look at the, the uh, non-threshold prediction. So we can project and look what, see what it would look like in the future. And actually, it seems to be quite good for the future. Um, but this is um, an analysis that most many people are interested in. Um, under different climate scenarios, um, uh, what would the suitability look like in the future? Uh, we also might be very interested in uncertainty with this with this projection. So the climate in the future probably is very different from the climate today, given the scenario we did. We can calculate the um, similarity of the environment uh, in the future compared to the one that we used to build the model using a mess analysis, which I just did. So the uh, whiter colors are uh, areas where the environment is more different um, in the future than it is in the present. And the uh, darker red colors are areas that are more similar. So at these areas right here that are very white probably have higher uncertainty because the environmental variables are very different in the future. So we might want to um, treat those with more uncertainty. Finally, um, we can go to our session code step and uh, download um, all of our code. I'm gonna do that right now. And that comes in a R markdown file, which I'll show you. So we're opening that in our studio. And here it is, it's kind of hard to see. So here is our um, code, it is annotated. All this is just regular text. There are code blocks in gray. That is the actual R code. Um, you can run this in R just by pressing this button, uh, run all. It will run this entire thing and reproduce all the data from your analysis. Um, and you can then take it from there in R. If you wanted to make any modifications to any of these steps, say, oh, I didn't actually want to remove um, uh, point number 87. I wanted to remove 88. It's as easy as doing this. Um, or just you know remove the entire line or comment it out. Um, do whatever you want um, if you are familiar with the code. Um, the idea is that you can use this code um, as supplemental information for uh, a journal article if you were to make a, a model in Wallace, or you could you know, um, send your model, sorry, send your entire analysis to collaborators um, in case they wanted to run the model on their machine and see what you did. Uh, and uh, thus ends our live demonstration. Uh, oh, I also wanted to point out one last thing. Uh, for each of these components, we have the uh, references for the packages that were used. So in this case, we're using the R Markdown package. We have all the authors of the package. We have um, a link to the, the, the web pages for the packages. And this is the same for each of the uh, components and modules. Um, so as I said before, we're trying to highlight um, the uh, R packages and the people who made them. OK, that ends the live demonstration. I will now move back to the presentation. Okay, so uh, where is Wallace today? Um, the full release, which is we were calling 1.0, um, came out in November of last year. The current version is 1.0.4, um, uh, which re really is just a couple of bug fixes, but, but nothing too uh, major. Um, the software note um, came out in April, or was published in April, but came out last year, early, um, uh, early view. Uh, so please give, uh, give it a read if you're interested in more detail about the Wallace project and the software. Um, and we do have um, NSF funding now to respond uh, to immediate user needs. So if users have questions, um, uh, NSF can pay me to answer them via the Google group or the Wallace email. Um, both of which are uh, linked in the presentation. Uh, we have new exciting NSF funding to work with external partners to add new modules. So the idea is uh, other labs that have methods that are not in here might want to add them to Wallace so that other people can use them to uh, disseminate their methods better to a broader audience. We've already worked with a, a couple of partners and it's been very successful. Um, the new 1.0.5 version with a vignette is coming soon, thanks to this grant. And we're also working on a multi-species version of Wallace where you can make uh, multiple single species models and compare them and do things like niche overlap. And that's also thanks to our partners. And very importantly, we're also making a very big effort to broaden human diversity in our project. And we've had the great opportunity to work with 
a number of uh, very smart women uh, and uh, minority uh, biogeographers and coders, and we hope to work with many more. Third, uh, we also have new NASA funding uh, led by Mary Blair at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, this funding is to develop new R packages that use remote sensing data and develop um, biodiversity, in, calculate biodiversity indicators. And the idea is to add these to Wallace and also to interface with a Colombian uh, conservation entity, uh, the Humboldt Institute, uh, this is the country of Colombia, mind you, uh, that runs a very good web app called Biomodelos. Um, and we're working closely with the Colombian scientists uh, uh, to develop these biodiversity indicators and work on these packages. Um, and that's been a great experience too. Uh, and we have our, yeah, the grant information and the uh, uh, affiliations on the right. So I'd like to thank you for allowing me to present this today. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I hope to get lots of feedback. Um, here's a link to the uh, official Wallace email. Um, there's also a link to the Google group where if you have questions about Wallace, I'd really prefer you to post there instead of emailing me personally. Um, there's the GitHub page, which has all the code for Wallace and all of our development stuff and everything going on. None of this is secret. It's all up on GitHub. If you have um, bugs um, and you're, you're a GitHub user, please um, log these as GitHub issues. Um, that's the most useful way for me to log the issues and, and uh, record that I've taken care of them. Um, uh, we also have a website for Wallace, which is up there. There's a link for the Anderson Lab. And I also want to mention that uh, two other lab mates, uh, Sarah Minin and Gonzalo Pinillo, uh, which are up on the uh, top right of the screen, they are currently working with me on Wallace, and um, uh, it's been a great experience working with them as well. So it's not just me. Um, and uh, on the right, you will see a nice chrono sequence of the Anderson Lab. And on the bottom, you'll see our sponsors which are many and affiliations. So uh, thank you, and thus ends the presentation. Thanks, Jamie.